and welcome to the Tuckahoe Town Meeting on the 2016 bond referendum. We have a nice group here this evening. I hope you will listen and ask questions. Uh, this evening we are video streaming live on, uh, yeah, on um, YouTube and we have our IT person here who works with us on the third floor and uh, Carrie Tratina is going to talk to those of you who are online and watching this live, how you can ask questions and participate in tonight's meeting. So Carrie. Thank you, Mrs. O'Bannon. I want to thank everyone who's attending in person and online. We're very excited to have you if you're virtual or in person. Uh, to submit a question in person, it's pretty easy. Just raise your hand, we'll, we'll take you. And then online, I hope you can see the screen. There are a couple ways that you can ask us questions or participate. You can live chat. On your screen to the right, there should be a box. If you have a Google account, you can sign in. If you don't have a Google account, you can make one in less than a minute and participate. It's free. Also, you can email me at tre08 at henrico.us, or you can tweet Henrico County, uh, the at sign, County of Henrico. It's pretty easy. If there are no questions in the audience for me, then I will hand it back over to Mr. Bannon. Thank you. All right, well, tonight we're going to discuss um, a vote that you're going to take on November 8th, along with the president, the presidential election. On the front page of your ballot, there are five people running for president with their vice presidential candidates. And if you turn the ballot over, you will be voting on five items on a bond referendum. Now, these items will be voted on separately. Each of the items, and I see some of you have a brochure that we have available here tonight. And in this brochure, it shows you the different questions and the actual wording of the questions. So those of you online, if you're interested, you can get one of these brochures, or it is available online. And it tells you the exact wording of the questions. There are a couple of other questions on the referendum or on the ballot on November 8th. And we'll probably mention those too as we go along because you're going to see uh, on, on our screen, you're going to see uh, a copy of the ballot. So this evening, as we talk about each one of these issues, uh, after each of the presentations, uh, I'm hoping that there will be a question or two. If you have a question, again, raise your hand or email Ms. Tradina or, or do the, um, the uh, Google and get on the Google on the right side of your screen. I uh, ask her the questions and we will answer them after each one of the five presentations. And then at the end, if there are any other questions, general questions probably, uh, we'll, those will be answered too. We have a lot of people here tonight to speak. <laughs> now you've met Carrie Tratina. We have with us this evening starting off as Deputy County Manager for Community Services, Brandon Hinton. Also we have the Superintendent of Public Schools, Dr. Patrick Kinlaw, uh, the Director of Recreation and Parks, Neil Luther, uh, the Director of Libraries, Jerry McKenna, he's going to be speaking, and our Fire Chief, Tony McDowell, and the Director of Public Works, Steve Yob. And I know you may have other questions for them if, if they could be directed to what they're speaking on first uh, on the bond referendum items, but at the end you might have a question or two for them generally. That's okay too. Um, also, we have with us Linda Lee, who's the assistant to the Board of Supervisors. And um, I don't believe we have any other elected officials here, but we have Officer Scott Phillips, who is our Tuckahoe uh, community officer. And he's the one that would um, fill us in if there's something going on in Tuckahoe that we need to know about. He covers our area for us. So first, if we start with Brandon Hinton, our Deputy, Deputy County Manager. Mr. Hinton. Thank you, Mrs. O'Bannon, and thank you all for coming this evening. Um, I hope you brought a lot of good questions. That's what we're here for, frankly, is to answer your questions on uh, the 2016 bond referendum. Um, so Mrs. O'Bannon referenced, well, let me first say, uh, the 2016 bond referendum, um, so what is a bond referendum, and why are we pursuing a bond referendum? Uh, a bond referendum is, um, is the method counties in Virginia must use to, uh, to build large infrastructure projects, to issue bonds to build large infrastructure projects. Uh, that is unlike cities in the state. Uh, cities in the state have, uh, have the ability to issue uh, general obligation bonds uh, without the vote of the people. Counties do not have that option. So um, 
we are coming before our citizens and asking five questions, as Mrs. O'Bannon noted. Um, and we're going to go through that, what those questions are in a moment. I uh, also want to mention, so general obligation bonds uh, are the cheapest form of debt a county can incur. And the reason for that, especially for Henrico County, uh, Henrico is one of 39 counties in the entire country that have a triple triple A bond rating. Um, and there is a flight to quality, particularly right now, um, interest rates are very low uh, in this environment. And so the county is able to issue debt at the utmost um, or, or the absolute lowest possible interest rate with general obligation bonds and fully utilizing that triple triple A uh, bond rating. Now, uh, Mrs. O'Bannon noted uh, that there were either uh, two sides to the ballot. Of course, we're back to paper ballots now. Uh, that wasn't the case four years ago. And paper ballots have a defined size. Um, and there are so many items on the, um, on the ballot this year, on November the 8th, uh, that there are two sided. Uh, there are two sides to the ballot, and there are questions on, um, on both the front and the back, as Mrs. O'Bannon noted. On the front page, You'll see, of course, as Mrs. O'Bannon noted, the, the president question, the, the one that we can't escape these days uh, on the news and everywhere else. Um, and then there's a state official, depending on what district you live in. Uh, there will be a, a member of the House of Representatives question. You'll also see two constitutional amendments at the state level that are on the ballot statewide. Um, and we can um, read those to you if you want, or if you want to go to the website, the State Board of Elections has a lot more detail on those questions. So that's the front page of your ballot. The back page of your ballot is the local questions, the five bond referendum questions uh, the county is asking our citizens to vote on. And again, as we mentioned earlier, you'll see uh, five questions involving school projects, recreation and park projects, library projects, fire stations, and roads. And we're going to touch on each of these in much more detail, as Mrs. O'Bannon noted throughout this evening. Uh, what I do want to note, though, is the, the, uh, the questions and how they're worded. In the pamphlets that you all have in front of you, you can, have, you can see a copy of those questions if you can't read the screen. Uh, if we had our way, we certainly wouldn't uh, put questions that are this complicated out there. But by law, we're required to word them as such. You can see that it even references Public Finance Act of 1991. That could confuse the lay voter in Henrico County. So make sure you read that question and understand what it is that you're voting on when you see that question on the back of the ballot. Now, um, if you'll indulge me for one moment, we have a quick video I'd like to share with you that I think captures the essence of what we're asking uh, our citizens to vote on. Here.
So, so in all, um, when you look at all five questions and all the projects before you, you'll see 26 individual projects that are being proposed. Uh, the total of uh, the total of the overall bond referendum is $419.8 million. As you heard the manager mention, two thirds of that, $272.6 million, is uh, is dedicated to our school system. Uh, and the rest you can see by category in your sheets, and we're going to go through that in one moment, um, how the dollars are allocated by, by area. Uh, but I want to reemphasize one piece that the county manager noted in his video. I want to emphasize that there is absolutely no tax rate increase whatsoever would be required to accomplish issuing these bonds over the six-year period that we propose to issue the debt. Uh, we have worked out meticul meticulously a financing plan, and I was the budget director for the last four years and was, was heavily involved uh, in the planning of this. Um, where we, as the manager noted, uh, we're using resources that are already um, in place to fund these, these bonds. Uh, manager noted meals tax revenues. Uh, the meals tax has, uh, has well exceeded our expectations. And um, of course, the meals tax is dedicated to our school system. That, that premise has not changed. So the differential between what we've budgeted in meals tax resources and what we're collecting is being dedicated for large infrastructure projects and would be used to help pay debt service on the bonds that we issue specifically for schools. On the tourism side, uh, the last three years, we've seen a very healthy increase in hotel motel tax revenues. We have a large tourism presence in Henrico County between sports tourism, business tourism, uh, many different forms of tourism, and we're seeing that uh, very successfully uh, grow over the last few years. And uh, you'll see in a moment, uh, especially with our recreation and parks projects, that there's an emphasis on sports tourism projects in Henrico to continue that effort. So it, it seems like um, it makes a lot of sense for me that we're reinvesting hotel motel tax dollars towards additional sports tourism efforts to continue to bring uh, visitors to our county that spend money uh, in our county, that shop at our, um, shop at our malls, that eat at our restaurants, and certainly stay at our hotels. The other reason we can um, assure no tax rate increase is that over the last five years, and, and this graph shows our total outstanding debt in Henrico County. Uh, and you can see in blue the, uh, our existing plan on our current existing debt. And in green, you can see uh, what that amount would be should the bond referendum pass in Henrico County. Um, and the last five years, the county has paid off almost one third of its overall outstanding debt. Um, that's how we've been able to afford uh, this bond referendum without a tax rate increase. You can see in green the overlay on what those bonds would do to our overall outstanding debt. And you can see at the top that we would actually, our total outstanding debt would remain lower than levels experienced in 2012. We're very meticulous when it comes to debt management in Henrico County. Uh, one of the reasons we do have a triple triple A bond rating and we're not uh, changing uh, from, from or steering away from that premise with this bond referendum. Yes, ma'am. Just one brief pause, everyone. And this is why you brought Carrie. <laughs> um, and the final slide I want to share before we go into project specific and, and certainly um, answer any questions on the financing that you might have. Um, Carrie, could you go back one slide? Um, so you see again, the $419.8 million is the total bond referendum. You can see the allocation by area, $272.6 million for schools, $87.1 million for recreation and parks, $24 million for a library project, $22.1 million for fire station uh, or fire projects, and $14 million for a road project. And that, in total, totals your 419 million million dollars. And um, with that as an overview of the financing plan, I'd be happy to answer any questions you all might have. Let's go back to the amendment. Uh, what are the right to work for? Is that the constitutional amendments? Sure. Is that one of these amendments? Yes. Hey, could, you, could you turn back to the ballot, the front page? You, you need my glasses almost for this one. I, um, so uh, one is, uh, is um, so I'll just read the questions if that's okay. I think that might help. Uh, should Article 1 
of the Constitution of Virginia be amended to prohibit any agreement or combination between an employer and a labor union or labor organization whereby one, non-members of the union or organization are denied the right to work for the employer. Two, membership to the union or organization is made a condition of employment or continuation of employment by such employer. Or three, the union or organization acquires an employment monopoly in any such enterprise. So the one you were referencing, question two, Shall the Constitution of Virginia be amended to allow the General Assembly to provide an option to the localities to exempt from taxation the real property of the surviving spouse of any law enforcement officer, firefighter, search and rescue personnel, or emergency medical services personnel who was killed in the line of duty where the surviving spouse occupies the real property as his or her principal place of residence and has not, rem uh, and has not remarried? Those are your two questions. Any other questions uh, on the financing side? If not, we'd like to go into the project-specific detail, and I'd like to introduce Dr. Pat, Pat Kenlaw uh, from our school system, who's going to go through the, uh, the school projects. Okay. All right, thanks, Brandon, and, and good evening. I want to begin by thanking you for coming out tonight and your willingness to gather additional information about the bond program so you can make an informed decision. So thanks for your participation. Um, we have a number of projects in the bond program to support our schools. We have 72 campuses in Henrico County, and over 50% of the schools that we have are over 50 years old. And the projects that we're putting forward in bond, the average age of the school is 57 years old. And so if you uh, have a house, an apartment, or a condo that you keep up, you know, from time to time, you have to do things to take care of it, and then it, depending on how old it is, there's times where you really have to provide an upgrade um, to, or add an addition if your family grows, and so we're well past that 50-year point where we need to do some work in our schools. If you, have, if you have hundreds of kids come through your house also, you know the impact that that can have on a facility. So it's really a challenge to keep them upgraded, and so this is going to help us with our oldest schools. So the schools that we're uh, looking at renovating that are 50, 50 years old or older, Tuckahoe Middle School, which serves some students in this area, it's one of the larger parts of the bond. Tucker High School also serves students in uh, this area. Seven Pines Elementary School is 57 years old. Skip With is 59 years old. Adams Elementary is 50 years old. Chamberlain is 55 years old. Crestview Elementary is 61 years old. And Pemberton is 61 years old. So, those, so for all of those campuses, it's a complete facelift and overhaul of sorts, uh, where you're replacing windows and air conditions and those sorts of things, repairing roofs. Then we have two projects that are capacity projects, meaning we have some schools that have more students than we can fit into the building. And so we need some additional space. One of those is Glen Allen Elementary School. They have, I believe they're up to six, what you would call trailers. We like to call them learning cottages. That has a little bit better ring to it. Um, and so we want to be able to have those students housed in the building. So we're proposing an addition there. And then in the, in the Brooklyn area, we're proposing a, to, to acquire land and build a new elementary school. At Johnson Elementary and Holiday and Trevette, those schools are over capacity. For example, at Holiday, they have eight learning cottages. And so we need some more space to pull some students from those schools. So we're uh, doing a school in that area. And that would be good for economic development in the Brooklyn District as well. And then the last part of the, the education of, of this is the technical centers that we want to add. We have t um, career and technical education programs. You may know them as tech centers or tech ed. And we have uh, each year over 1,000 students who want to enroll in these programs, but we can't take them because we don't have the space. And these programs, we offer over 100 classes that are ranging from culinary arts to cosmetology to auto automobile repair, engineering, plumbing, computer coding, things that kids can go to our high schools and come out with an industrial, an industry credential and move into well-paying jobs immediately. And so that's a real viable pathway for a lot of our students that we're not meeting right now. And also, we need to put students in those roles for economic development to support the workforce that's needed 
for a lot of our organizations and businesses in the community. So we're proposing one at Glen Allen, Glen Allen High School. When we built that high school, we went ahead and developed some land for a technical center because we knew we were going to have a need, so that site's ready to go. And then in the eastern area, in the Verina district, we're going to build a career and technical center, um, sort of an innovation center, and it might be like a tech center on steroids. Um, we're working with the businesses. We've met with the 50 representatives from the 50 largest employers in the county, and we said we've got this opportunity to build this new technical center, and this will be, you know, not, not right away. There'll be some time out. And we said, what is it that you need as a part of the workforce that we can prepare our students for through this program? So they're really excited to have the opportunity to help us design what programs are going to be included in this particular building. So we think that'll be a huge advantage to, to our students. So that's the school portion of the bond. And if there's any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them for you. Yes. Oh gosh, um, I would I would say I would say probably forty or fifty. Um, some of those programs too are, are program trailers. Say if we put um, a special program at a school, we may be housing that there um, temporarily until we have we go through redistricting those sorts of things. But we have a lot fewer than we used to since we've had a couple of bond referendums that provide additions. Right. Well, and it, some of these schools like that are it, like Holiday, I mean, they're growing so fast, their trailers have been there for a while, and that's what we're trying to remedy with this new school. Thank you for that question. Anything else for schools? All right, Brandon? Thank you, Dr. Kenlaw. And I want to emphasize once more that the, the school's question is one of five questions. So all the projects that Dr. Kenlaw just spoke to um, involve the, the very first question on the ballot, on the back of the ballot. Um, and so that brings us to the second question on the ballot, which is the recreation and parks questions um, or, or projects. And um, Mr. Neil Luther, the director of recreation and parks, is here to speak on this. Thank you all very much. Um, glad that uh, I could be here this evening. The recreation and parks component of the referendum is a total of nine projects. Uh, I'm going to begin with, with this one. Um, for some folks, this may be a little odd because it, it uh, is actually a recreation and parks project that's proposed on school board property. Uh, but what we're talking about here is going into all nine high school locations and taking the uh, stadium fields at those locations and making a conversion of the athletic field from the grass that's there now over to a synthetic turf. And this really is being done under our complement because we depend tremendously as a department on access to school fields and school facilities to support general recreation programming for the community. We have uh, about 40, uh, 43,000 Henrico County uh, youth that are uh, participating in organized sports activities uh, through us and we depend and rely heavily on access to the school facilities to be able to support that workload. This project also has a dual benefit to the school system because what this is essentially doing as Dr. Kinlaw talked about the age of the school buildings, the athletic facilities are aging as well. This, pretend, this project represents a capital reinvestment in an existing facility at all nine locations that expands the opportunity for use. So it opens up potential for, for greater access and use by the school system as well as by us for those uh, children that are playing through our programs and also as Brandon touched on to, to add to our available field complement for weekend use for, for tournaments. A great example of, of benefit for this project is Freeman High School. Uh, Freeman is an older landlocked campus. There isn't any opportunity uh, to really add additional field space at, at Freeman. The conversion of, of the field over to, at Freeman to a synthetic turf will allow um, exponentially more use of the field. So all of those high school teams that play there now that are struggling to find field space are going to have better, more reliable access to fields during their athletic uh, season 
and we would be able as a, a recreation and parks department to be able to put uh, uh, again users uh, over on that field um, during times when the school system isn't using them. The, the next slate of projects really run the gamut to uh, make some, some much needed capital reinvestment in the general park system. Our park system is, is very unique when you go around the country because we didn't exist as a parks department with parks until 1977. Uh, we were recreation uh, going back to the mid-60s, but we did not as a county have any public parks until the citizens of this community passed a referendum in 1977 to create a park system. So the parks that came off of that referendum, like uh, Cheswick Park, like uh, Dory Park, like Deep Run Park, like Three Lakes Park. They all date to the early 1980s in the case of Cheswick, our first park that opened in 1980. Uh, Three Lakes came along in the, in the late 80s. So our park system is, is aging, and um, it's aging by uh, years of service, and it's aging by demand of use. So the, the project slate here really represents uh, an opportunity to invest or reinvest in capital um, infrastructure in these parks that run the range, the athletic fields to trail systems to uh, uh, replacing picnic shelters, restrooms, bringing things up to uh, current expectations, to current um, uh, ADA accessibility requirements, to current code standards, and basically given a complete refresh to parks that are very well used and loved by the uh, public here, uh, but are getting to be 30, 35 years old and, and, and need some, some, some time and attention. And the final two projects that round out our complement are two growth projects related to uh, or associated with, with demand for new facilities, uh, additional um, park space. Greenwood Park, uh, on the left of the screen up behind me, is a new athletic complex along the I-95 corridor. Uh, as Brandon spoke earlier, visitation for organized sports activity is a very real and, and big uh, economic engine for this community. We're well positioned uh, along the I-95 corridor to pull from a, a tremendous um, population base. Henrico is a great place to come and, and uh, spend some time if you're participating over the weekend with your children in a sporting event. And in calendar year 2016, just to, to give a flavor for what that really translates into, um, by the end of this calendar year, we're going to have brought in roughly 105,000 visitors from outside of the metro area that have come along with their child to play in a, a soccer tournament, softball tournament, a baseball tournament. Uh, that's a cumulative spending impact of uh, about $36 million. So we're attractive, but the flip to that is that we don't have enough fields to meet the entire demand that's available out there. Uh, so during that same calendar year period, we're going to have turned away visitation of another 100,000 or, or so visitors and a lost economic opportunity, spending opportunity in the uh, economy here in Henrico of an additional $42 million. And that's all predicated on a fundamental reality that we don't have enough fields available to meet the demand that's out there within our own community for use by um, uh, youth that are playing organized activities here, as well as the additional demand that we get uh, on weekends for these visitors that, and these tournament organizers that want to come to Henrico County uh, to bring their tournament. And, and then the second new I'm sorry. Is tournament organized? Do they pay to use this? Uh, no, we don't charge for, for youth activities. We've made a conscious decision that the, uh, we don't want to be sort of penny-wise and pound-foolish because, you know, the, it's a very competitive market uh, nationally, and for us to charge a tournament organizer a, a field use fee um, become somewhat of a competitive disincentive and the return that we get on the, the spending in the local economy is much greater than we as a, you know, it, we would be able to recoup. Um, the average spending per person for these tournaments, and that's a calculation that we get through the regional tourism, um, group, Richmond Region Tourism, is about $205 uh, per day per visitor is the spending um, uh, formula. 
Greenwood is a, we, the county, it's about 200 acres. It's right off of um, 295 at Woodman Road, if, uh, the Woodman Road exit. At Greenwood Elementary School, it's actually on Greenwood Road. So if you were to get off of 295, uh, Woodman Road actually dead ends at Greenwood, right there, pretty much at the interchange. And this property is about a half a mile um, uh, west of that interchange. They're actually, um, they are, they can be configured for any field use you want. So you can play soccer, you can play field hockey, you can play lacrosse, you can play football, you can play rugby. They're synthetic, but they're not going to be lined permanently. So you can basically reconfigure however you need to um, to accommodate whatever group is, is, is coming in to use them. Um, and then the, the last new project or growth project for us is a, another um, larger piece of property that was just acquired by the county about a year ago. Uh, it is in the, um, you can see on the, the airport runway, it's uh, in the uh, Williamsburg Red Corridor in the Sanson area. That's been an area that has been under parked for years. Uh, we actually identified the need for a park going all the way back to the uh, original 1995 uh, comprehensive uh, plan for the, the Division of Recreation and Parks. So, so the property was acquired about a year ago, and this bond project uh, would provide funding to go forward with design and development of that um, community park. Again, like all of our parks, it would include a mixture of, of active uses for athletic uh, purposes. We have a tremendous demand in that area that's unmet for access to fields. But it's also balanced out with other general community park features, walking trails, picnic areas, play equipment, things of that nature that, that balance out our, um, our offering to the, the public for recreational use. I'd be happy to take any questions or? Sure. Main sure. Uh, the question for, for the viewers uh, was uh, the Deep Run project had mentioned in, in some literature uh, improvements to include a cricket pitch. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then um, the question was, you know, is it going to be multipurpose or is it cricket dedicated? Mm -hmm. the, the, the Deep Run Park opened up in 1984. Mm -hmm. um, and the athletic field piece of that. Is, is a renovation of the existing fields that are there, the soccer fields. And the intention is to do a, a multi-purpose renovation. Those fields are, are, they need some attention. The, the ability to use those fields for other uses like soccer or anything, uh, any other field sports wouldn't be compromised by being able to put cricket. So it's really a, um, a use plus arrangement. So you, you would be able to, yes, we would, uh, we would intend to be able to use it for cricket, but it wouldn't preclude other uses. Um, cricket as a sport is, has grown in this area. There is a larger group, uh, contingent of, of folks that are playing. The challenge with cricket is it's somewhat unique because it requires a large area. It's played in the round, and it requires basically the equivalent of a, a baseball infield that's centered right in the middle of a, a large, you know, four to five acre area. The three fields that we have at Deep Run are about four to five acres. So basically it's a renovation for those fields to allow a continuation of the use that's there now, as well as make, the, make that area suitable for um, uh, playing cricket. The, the renovation project includes other things in the park, for example, um, one of the things that we've needed to do for a while is bring in street lighting along the roadway because um, it can get really dark if you're driving in there after dark. Um, uh, again, like all the other parks, uh, addressing 
the play areas, the picnic pavilions, and, and those things. So it, it is a project that's intended to be spread around the entire park to include addressing the athletic fields, but not exclusively for cricket. It, it is. The question. The question was the um, the choice of, of turf for or the uh, for the deep run project, and the question is absolutely spot on because we struggle and deep run is a great example when I talked about the struggle we have for keeping fields in play playable condition um, because they get so much use. In the case of Deep Run, we are looking to keep it in grass, but the problem that we have at Deep Run, and one of the reasons that you see so much uh, reseeding out there is because those fields, there's a lot of rock out at Deep Run, and when those fields were built, there, there are some, there's some drainage challenges. Um, and so we're not at this point planning to do those fields over in synthetic. We feel like the uh, a correct rebuild of those fields to be able to be addressed with this project would go a long way towards helping the, the situation that we run into out there. Um, they need to be all basically leveled out to one, so yes ma'am, to, to, to bring it to, to one unified grade so that we don't have that terrorist effect that you have out there. Yes ma'am. The question for the uh, viewership is um, with the, the, the project related to the school improvement being under the recreation portfolio, how are we going to convey clearly that the uh, project, that particular project, even though it's on school board property, has a general recreation and community benefit? And, and really the answer is that's why we're going around to, to venues like this uh, to talk to people. Uh, to make sure that we're providing the staff clear, clear information about what the projects are, what they entail, and, and really, um, it, you know, it's, it's been said before, it'll be said again, you know, we, we as staff are, are open to coming to any group to talk to, to folks and, and make sure that the information is, um, you know, put out there very clearly. As far as operationally, when that, with the, the fields, the scheduling of those high school locations we have to work with the school system, but basically, if, if that project were to be completed, we as recreation and parks would be, um, you know, wor working with the school to handle the scheduling and to basically pull it into our portfolio to make sure that we're, you know, having the appropriate use for the community. Because again, the project is based on benefit. It's a, it's a benefit plus arrangement where the school system and the school, the, the users in the school system benefit but the general community benefits as well. You mentioned putting street lights in people. Didn't you say that? We had look, talked about street lighting. Did the park close at night? The park closes at night. Uh, excuse me. The question was street lighting. I had mentioned street lighting as, as a potential piece of the Deep Run project. Uh, the parks, all of our parks close uh, at dusk. At Deep Run, of course, we have a recreation center there that's open until 10 o'clock. So the problem we're having, the concern we have at Deep Run is on a dark night like tonight when it's raining, people come down that hill, um, it's very difficult to see the edge of the roadway. So um, we're not trying to, to, to light the park, we're just trying to make sure we make a safety improvement um, along the roadway because the, the recreation center gets a lot of use 
after after hours. Well, that it, it, the parks, it becomes a park uh, project, it becomes a park, uh, a recreation responsibility for maintenance. And keep in mind, these fields are, are synthetic, so we're not talking about all nine high schools would be done over, just the high schools, the nine uh, stadium fields at, at all nine high schools, because those are the fields that get the, the most amount of wear and tear currently. <laughs> And honestly, they're getting that wear and tear without any ability for the general community to get access to them. Because the school system, you know, has, Freeman, a good example, during the spring you have men's and women's soccer, uh, men's and women's lacrosse at both the varsity and JV level. So you have a tremendous demand that the field, the grass field that's there that was built probably in 1950, uh, when it was originally laid out, just cannot handle. So the benefit to the athletic field conversion project is a, um, a benefit to the entire community. So it pulls in uh, a benefit for the school users as well as the general community. Now, good question. The question was, um, with the school project, is it going to be, are, are we going to be able to make the, those fields more available to um, the, the community? And the answer is yes. That's the whole re reason behind the project is to allow, we know, for example, a lot of people like to walk on, on the tracks and, um, you know, to be able to go out and to, uh, you know, we, we would control the, and we'd have to work, obviously, with the school system and, and the principal because there are times when school use would preempt community use. But yes, the answer is that it, it would be, and that's why it's under the recreation portfolio, is it's an opportunity to get more access and more value to the general community out of those um, facilities on the school property. Thank you, Neil. And uh, before we go to the library project, I want to uh, make sure everybody who's watching on, uh, on the internet know that we're getting your questions. Um, we are logging them down. We're going to address a lot of those at the end. Uh, but I know uh, one question came in about the video. I know it was hard to hear uh, online. The video is available in two different places. One, there is a website. And for those of you that are in attendance, can see that website on your, on your brochures. It's henrico.us slash bonds. So for those of you who are at home with your internet uh, capability, you can go out and look at it. The video is out there uh, as a link. Uh, but you can also see it on our YouTube channel. Uh, Mr. Tina wanted, to make sure that, uh, wanted me to make sure I mentioned that the YouTube channel, and it is an option out there as well. Uh, but again, we're going to address some of your questions uh, at the end. Uh, but with that, uh, we have one library project on the ballot, and uh, Mr. Jerry McKenna is here to speak to it. Thank you, Brandon. Um, we have one library project, and it is to replace the Fairfield Library. It is our oldest and smallest library. It's on North Laburnum Avenue. And what we've done is already purchased 10 acres of land across from the Easton Recreation Center. And what we're proposing to do is replace this facility at the, at the new site. We are unable to provide the same services that you provide, you receive here at the Tuckahoe Library and at Twin Hickory. This was the first project we did, which was approved by you, the voters, in 2000. And, then, and we opened this building in October of 2006. And then we opened 
Twin Hickory Library uh, in July of 2007. Uh, part of the 2005 bond referendum were two library projects, the replacement of the Dumbarton Library with the Libby Mill Library, and then we pr just opened in June of this, this year the Verina Area Library, which is the, a library. We replaced the small branch library. So what we're going to do is pro provide the same types of services that we have here and at other area libraries that are of that similar size. So I'll be happy to answer any questions. And then look to build a new building. Absolutely. What this will turn into the county uh, property. And uh, one good example is at Dunbar Library, the building is being repurposed to house the recreation and parks. And another good example is the old Tuckahoe Library is uh, we have fire logistics there and also library administration. So we look to reuse these properties. And to give you a little hint, Dumbarton, this third repurposing was the first time the cafetorium was actually for the original Dumbarton Elementary School. They, they tore down the uh, elementary school, kept the cafetorium, which we used uh, when, we re when we built the original Dumbarton Library. So number three. Any other questions? Oops. I'm, I know, but I'm trying to leave. <laughs> See, I'm going this way. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Jerry. And we have uh, two more. Again, so the library question is a standalone question. It's the third question of five uh, on the back of the ballot. The fourth question uh, relates to fire projects. And uh, Chief McDowell is here to speak to those. Thank you, Brandon. My name is Tony McDowell. I'm the fire chief. Uh, the, there are two um, components to the proposed fire station, fire facility improvements that will be on the bond project. And I need to back up and, and um, just sort of reiterate that your fire department does not just respond to fires. We're a full service emergency services organization, so we handle not only all the fires that occur in the county, but emergency medical services calls, hazardous conditions, hazardous materials. On a night like tonight, when there's thunder and lightning, if you, if you were to have um, you know, a tree limb fall down or a tree fall down your property, and it, takes down a power line and your power goes out, it's the fire department that's out doing damage assessment and help people to remove that debris and, and to make sure that they're safe. So this year we expect to respond to about 47 to 48,000 calls countywide. Now when we do that, we, we endeavor to maintain a response time of six minutes and 20 seconds. And that's from when you place the 911 call to when we arrive in front of your house. Six minutes and 20 seconds, 90% of the time. And what we're finding is that we're having a challenge achieving that response time goals, particularly in certain parts of the county. And if you look at, the, at this slide, there's a map, and it shows areas where over the course of the past three years that we've had difficulty achieving our response times. And those areas are concentrated by the darker colors, kind of like a map of a thunderstorm like we're having tonight. But the darker the color, the more number of calls where 911 calls where we were unable to meet our response time goal. And so where these two red dots are, are the areas that we're proposing to build new fire stations. One in the western part of the county near Staples Mill in Glenside, and another in the eastern portion of the county on Nine Mile Road near Laburnum or Cedar Fork. And we believe that adding a, a firehouse in each one of these locations will allow us to improve response times to this area. Just as an aside, it's important to remember when we talk about six minutes and 20 seconds and the fact that we're not meeting those times in these areas that, you know, seconds really do matter in these kinds of emergencies. A fire will double in size every minute. And for a person who's suffering from cardiac arrest, whose heart has stopped, the chance of survival decreases by 10% for each minute that goes by without treatment. So we know that by doing this, that we can improve services and maintain both our accredited status as well as our premium insurance rating that we have in Enrico County. The second component of the fire projects is an addition to our training center. A lot of residents don't realize that we have a fire training center that's located 
uh, at the back side of the Woodman Road Depot. And the reason you may not realize it is because you can't see it driving by. You, you almost need to know where to go to find it. But it's been there since 1989. And this is where we train all of our recruit firefighters as well as our, our current incumbent firefighters. Now, we have a great burn building where we have um, where we can train firefighters to fight fires. And we have a number of, of really fantastic props to teach the classes. But we don't have is an academy, a, a classroom. Um, and so instead, we use this old one and a half car garage as a classroom. And you can see how crowded it is for one of our recruit academies. And we're hiring a lot of uh, new firefighters as we experience retirements and, and have uh, the need to hire more firefighters. We're hiring young men and women and they're working in this facility where they don't have time, where they don't have space for showers. There's, there's, not, there's nowhere for them to change clothes. And there's only one toilet for upwards of 25 or 30 recruits. So this portion of the project would build in addition to the training center that includes classroom space, locker rooms, showers, and some office space for staff. So that's an overview and summary of the fire projects. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Okay. Um, what is an ISO rating? Sure. So the question is, what is an ISO rating? There was a slide earlier in the presentation that you may recall uh, that said ISO rating one. ISO stands for the Insurance Service Office. ISO is a private corporation that performs uh, analysis of the quality of public fire protection in every community in the nation. So there's f almost 50,000 recognized local communities in, in the United States. And the ISO performs a public fire protection evaluation of each and every one of those communities, whether they ask for it or not, whether they want it to be done or not. And they sell that information to insurance companies. And insurance companies can use it to determine premiums for, among other things, uh, fire loss insurance. And so the rating scale goes from a 1 to 10. And 1 is the very best rating you can get, and 10 is the equivalent of having no organized fire protection whatsoever. Henrico County has had a very strong rating of three for upwards of 50 years. And that puts us in, in a very good category of communities nationwide. There's less than 150 communities at 50,000 in the United States with a rating of one. And with the support of the Board of Supervisors and the investments that they've made over the over a course of a number of years, last year we were able to improve our rating from a three to a one which makes us the only county in the nation to have an, an accredited fire department and an ISO class rating of one. In fact, when it's time for you to get your, your premium renewal, I would encourage you to contact your carrier and make sure that they're aware that, that, that they've got the information recorded for you that you live in Henrico County and that it's a class one insurance rating. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chief. And the, uh, so on the back of the ballot, again, the, the fifth and final question uh, is a $14 million question uh, for a road project. And Mr. Steve Yaw will speak to that. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And my name is Steve Yaw. I am the Director of Public Works for the county. And we do have one project on the ballot for roads this time, and that is the Richmond Henrico Turnpike, which is shown behind me. The Richmond Henrico Turnpike extends from Laburnum Avenue north across Azalea to the, just about the county line is where this project will end. It's two miles. It'll include a uh, divided road of uh, four lanes, a uh, mixed-use pedestrian path, and a sidewalk. Now, for those of you who don't know where this uh, road is, it's right adjacent to the Richmond International Raceway, where there's approximately 1,000 acres that uh, could be repurposed or, or other things might come in there. It's a very important uh, corridor for us. We've been doing a lot of work in that corridor recently. We've just put sidewalks on Laburnum Avenue. We did a landscaping project on Laburnum Avenue in front of there. And we also have a sidewalk project going up Richmond and Rico this year. So the county has been investing a lot of money in this area with the goal of uh, um, re-energizing uh, uh, re it and getting some, uh, some better things in the area. Now, we have 
only asked for $14 million from our voters for this project. This is a $41 million project, ladies and gentlemen. And um, I mention that because it's very important. We leverage our county assets, our county resources, with state and federal funds, and we're able to get 50%, 100% again what those funds are. But we need money to start with. We just can't go and ask the state and the federal government for money for road projects without us having some investment in it as well. So we're not asking for the entire entirety of this project. We're asking for about a third of it. And just to, to give you some example of the 39 projects the county has for roads right now across the county, we've got $81 million in funding from state and federal sources and only about $35 million from the county. So that's the kind of leverage we're able to achieve. So if you have any questions about this project, I'll be happy to address them. If not, I'll ask uh, Brandon and Ms. O'Bannon to close the meeting. Yes, sir. We, we have a, I'm sorry, do we have any other questions in mind beyond this project? Yes, yes we do, of course we do. Um, the $14 million we're asking for is specifically for this project, but it allows us to use our resources for other projects in the county. Um, for example, we've got projects on uh, three chopped right now. We've got a Sadler Road um, improvement project. Um, we've, pretty much every magisterial district has projects in it today. So this will give us a lot of uh, flexibility for doing projects countywide. The question was, does the county plan to do any further expansion or widening of Lauderdale Drive? And uh, it was set up for that a long time ago. There are portions of it you can see that were set up for that down at the very bottom, but we have no budget for an expansion of that road today. I mean, the right-of-way is there in some cases. But, but no, sir, we don't have plans today. Now, if traffic volumes um, show that the road needs to be adjusted, we will certainly put that on our list, but it, at this time it does not. Is there any reason for it being left undone for 40 years, 50 years, whatever it is, 45 years? Um, well, sir. It, 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 all the way across uh, Broadway and built a whole lot of rail over there in the, in the field, basically. North Gas, North, North Gate and Road, sir, is that? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, North Gate and Road, which we did um, almost three years ago now, established another important link to the northwestern uh, part of the, of the county, and that road is very much used. So, um, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Built it on two lanes. Two lanes going cars going both ways on two lanes. Yes, sir. It's a wonder you haven't had more accidents than every town people. I mean, it just, it just doesn't look Okay, well, thank you for your feedback, sir. So I, I can't say. Um, again, if, if traffic volumes justify the widening and improvement of Lauderdale, that's certainly a project we would undertake, but at this time there's not a, a need for it. And, and it was set up the right of way a long time ago there for for a wider road, but it hasn't shown the need for it. So, yes, ma'am. It does look funny that there's portions of it built. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. 
right? I'll let Neil Luther address that. Are there any other road questions before I turn the mic over? The reach out it will be widened between um, Gaskins Road all the way out to West Broad Village. So that project is under design. The design is uh, pretty much 100 percent and uh, we will soon be starting to uh, buy right way and do the other things that, uh, that we need to do. So any other road questions? Okay, thank you ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Luther. Thank you. Uh, the question was the choice of artificial turf and the uh, risk factor of artificial turf for sports injuries, sports-related injuries. Our plan um, with artificial turf is to, to go against what you predominantly see currently, the crumb rub or infill. Generally, artificial turf is a um, synthetic uh, carpet to mimic grass fibers. It's laid down and then it's uh, filled in with basically uh, crumb rubber um, that gives it weight that holds the, uh, carp uh, the uh, carpet in place. We're going with a different type of artificial turf. We're going with an organic uh, layup. So instead of the crumb rubber, we're going to be using uh, essentially a mixture of sand and uh, organic material like cork. Uh, fiber, it basically um, mimics in weight and playability, uh, you know, the, the surface feel, natural turf or uh, uh, natural grass. The other thing that goes along with that application is it has to be laid over an impact pad. So the 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 risk of the the the, the real concern is the the hardness, of concussion related in injuries. Most concussions actually happen from the impact of the head to the ground. The artificial layup that we're using has a, a it's called a G-Max impact rating that's actually um, equivalent to or better than uh, a high-end natural grass field. And because it's a, um, a, a pad, it doesn't, there's no curve. In other words, it doesn't deteriorate over time. So these fields will continue the same G-Max rating over their life whereas uh, the artificial turf fields that probably most folks are familiar with if their children play at strikers, for example, um, or any of the fields around here now with the crumb rubber, that actually deteriorates as it compacts over time. So the field actually plays harder and, and the risk of injury is um, greater over time. So we're, we're going with a different model. It's, it's uh, not quite the same that you're familiar with. Yes, ma'am. There are. The, the artificial or the organic layup has been used quite a bit in Europe. Um, so it has a large track record over there. Um, and the concern for player safety is related to concussion injuries and the, uh, the, the issues related to um, knee, knees and, and the, the give on, on, the, on the field. The, I've actually, there's, there's one field in Virginia that's been done in this uh, type, and it's up in uh, Fredericksburg area. The field, the, the layup plays closer to grass, and so the, the problem that you have with cl uh, cleats biting into the, um, the rubber and, and, and basically getting knee injuries, the risk factor for what we're choosing to go with is lower, and, and I don't have the studies I can get with you after this. And, provide that, but I, I can say that the, over the life of these fields, the, the player safety aspect is much better with the type of, of artificial turf layup uh, that we're going with as opposed to the more traditional crumb rubber. It's the, the, yes, the, the, the artificial turf combined with the organic infill plays closer to uh, a natural grass than any other synthetic option that's out there. And there's a whole range on the industry. There's a lot of, I mean, basically we're in the third generation now of artificial turf fields. And we believe very strongly that we're doing the, the right thing by making the choice for this kind of field 
because of all of the, the studies that, that, that express concerns about player safety. And, and player safety is concussion, it's uh, um, knee injuries and, and the give on the field. It's also heat and, and the uh, heat load for a crumb rubber field, and it gets hot here in the summer, a uh, black crumb rubber field can get 120, 130 degrees at surface temperature. Uh, a grass field, if it's a 95 degree day out and humid, will get right around 100, 105 degrees. This organic layup will hold to the same heat load as a natural grass field, so it's going to stay within that same temperature range as a, a, a regular natural grass field. No, no, that's okay. We want to take all the questions, but we want to take all the questions, but we are running a little over. We had hoped to keep this to an hour, and we wanted to know if there are any more general questions that anybody had, and I wanted to bring up one thing, and if, if Mr. Hinton could come forward, he was going to give us some general information, too, about uh, funding for the project. The question I've gotten in the past on bond referenda or when the county goes out uh, and presents itself to the banks and to the insurance companies, and you're going to talk about that, I hope. Um, when it goes out that we actually borrow the money, should the bond referendum pass, one or all, um, there's a process that we go through, and many people say, Henrico County is such a great investment, I would like to buy those bonds, or I would like to participate in buying those bonds. And we have now got a process where you as a citizen, if the bond referendum passes, you can invest in Henrico County. And I'm proud to say I have recently invested in water and sewer bonds <laughs> that recently the county um, put out there to, you know, to borrow the money on. And I told our investment counselor I wanted to make sure I invested in those bonds. And they were at those, that was at $5,000 increments you could invest in. So I'm hoping that Mr. Hinton will tell you how the bond process works once if it passes, this is what would happen. Thank you, Ms. Abandon. So the, really quickly, um, so uh, with the bonds, if they pass, again, they're going to be issued over a six-year period. Um, so as we go to bond market, um, we do, uh, so Ms. Abandon is actually, absolutely correct. For the last debt issue the county had uh, with the water and sewer bonds, we opened it up to our citizens for the first time um, ever. Out of, out of request and, uh, and a demand for that, uh, that will be the case again. Uh, they will be offered um, the opportunity to purchase bonds uh, in the bond market. And, um, and of course, you know, when you're looking at $419.8 million, a lot of those are purchased, uh, of course, by large institutions and those that are, they're, there's a flight to quality uh, always, especially when the economic instability, you know, that, that still persists. Um, investors want to know they have the highest quality bonds, and that's why Henrico can demand such a low interest rate. Uh, but citizens will have the opportunity, uh, businesses, local businesses will have the opportunity as well uh, to invest in county bonds uh, for the foreseeable future. We had such a success with the previous uh, water and sewer issue that we want to continue that. And we got a lot of positive feedback from that as well. Um, we had a couple questions online I want to touch on. Uh, the first one, uh, I know we had some, some technical issues uh, first off, but I want to reemphasize the ballot. Uh, the front of the ballot, again, has your presidential uh, candidates. It has uh, your House of Representatives question. It has two constitutional amendment uh, questions. And the back of the ballot has five questions uh, for the Henrico County bond referendum. Uh, the one, uh, one for each service area we spoke of uh, this evening, schools, recreation and parks, libraries, roads, and fire stations. Uh, so that's what the way the ballot's going to look, the paper ballot. Flip it over, please flip it over um, and, and see those questions that are on there, whether you vote yes or vote no, uh, please vote uh, on this project. Um, one other thing that, um, that we were asked is uh, to clarify the no tax rate premise. Um, so I, I want to mention one more thing. I know the audio was a little difficult to hear. Uh, so the county has put together this financing plan uh, to, to assure the citizens that we would not have to increase taxes of any sort in order to fund those projects. And we were able to do so 
uh, really for two reasons. One, uh, we paid off almost one third of our overall out outstanding debt of the last five years. So by paying down our debts, uh, we were able to afford um, more debt for infrastructure projects and keep within our thresholds, our very strict debt capacity thresholds. Um, so that was one reason. The second reason is we have two resources identified to help fund uh, a, a large portion of these projects. One being meals tax resources that are coming in better than we expected, better than revenue, uh, better than our, our revenue estimates. And again, those dollars are dedicated to our school system. Those dollars that come in over budget are dedicated to large infrastructure projects, the ones that are um, proposed in the bond referendum. And then, um, and then hotel motel tax revenues that have been coming in very successfully the last few years are being um, reinvested, if you will, to, um, to other sports tourism projects to continue to bring in people into our community, to spend money into our community. Um, and that's how we've been able to assure our citizens and businesses that a tax rate increase of any sort, any local tax rate increase is off the table completely when it comes to funding the bond referendum. And um, one final question. What happens if we have a downturn in the economy? Uh, this is a question we always ask, and we left ourself, ourselves a lot of flexibility as it relates to this bond issue. We're issuing all of this debt that we're planned over six years. Uh, by law, we have the ability to extend that to a seventh or eighth year. Uh, so just like in, in our 2005 bond referendum, we had to skip one year of debt issuance uh, to catch up, if you will, to lower our debt service, to, to ensure that we saved up enough, enough, enough dollars uh, to pay for um, the bonds in, in, the, in the following year. And we did that, and we are relieved that flexibility there as well. Uh, also, we're setting money aside in reserves in anticipation of a, a downturn. Uh, when we see news, like we've seen at the state level, where uh, they're having some budget difficulties, uh, we know that it's out there. Uh, the state revenues, and I won't bore you with all the numbers, uh, the state revenues make up about a third of our total general fund revenues. So um, we're saving money setting aside for, uh, for such an economic downturn and to assure that we can afford uh, these bonds. And we're doing a number of other things that we always do, conservative revenue estimates, um, spending to our means, uh, and, and doing all the, the things that this county is known uh, to do and to prepare for what's coming. And those are the questions that we received. Uh, any other questions of you all? Well, thank you for coming out this evening on a dark and stormy night. <laughs> and I appreciate the questions, all excellent questions, all very much to the point. Uh, this is being, has been uh, video streamed live, but it is also being recorded and archived. And you will be able to access it online to, through the YouTube site, which we will aim you at, <laughs> I guess I could say. We'll give you the, um, I'll give you the information on my website, which is, of course, patobannon.com, but also on the county site. And you can view it again if you want, or you can show it to friends, or you can tell them to go take a look, too. And we hope this has been very informative for you, because now it's your turn. You get to vote. You vote on November 8th for these projects, and tell us what you want us to do, the Board of Supervisors in the county and the people who have spoken here who are the directors of those different departments. So thank you for coming, and uh, be sure to vote on November 8th. And thank you for watching, and thank you for your questions online. Good evening. <laughs>